Yeah, I'll just start with some brief introductions. John, you've already had possibly the best introduction you could have, but uh, John, John Pfeffer is the founder of Pfeffer Capital and has background at KKR and various other things he can talk about today. Travis King, who is a uh, Traveled to be with us today. Thank you, Travis. Uh, is, is the CIO and founder of Ikigai Asset Management. I said that correctly, didn't I? Ikigai. That's it. Yep. And uh, Charles McGarry is the head of markets here at Blockchain. So we're going to be talking today about Bitcoin in the context, in kind of the global macro, macro context, Brexit, trade wars, um, and, and the like. And so I want to start by asking you this question. There seems to be an argument that's prevalent among crypto types especially uh, on Twitter, um, which may be a good or bad source for information, that talks about how in the current macro environment with uh, uh, central banks resuming QE, um, threats of recession and so on, that Bitcoin has a particularly, is, the, the Bitcoin as a sort of a macro hedge is particularly uh, appealing, that narrative is particularly strong and persuasive at this point. I wonder if I could ask you, I mean, this, I, I hope this will be an open panel where you can all speak freely with each other, but I wonder if we could just go along the line and, and just as a start to say kind of, do you agree with that idea? Is it a persuasive idea or is that just something that Bitcoin people like to talk about because they, we always need a narrative or a story in Bitcoin land? Charles, maybe I could start with you. Yeah, I totally buy into that idea. I think it's a great idea um, and 100% investable. Um, so yeah, so Bitcoin is awesome because your property rights are an operational fact of possessing the private key rather than a jurisdictional artifact of recourse to a legal system that may or may not retrade you at some future date. Okay, so that's kind of point number one. Point number two is that the supply curve is incredibly inelastic. It's basically, it's, it's, well, it's, firstly, it's 100% deterministic. Um, so everybody knows exactly what the future supply is. And secondly, it's, you know, it's small relative to the total float of existing Bitcoins. So basically, you know, changes in price are a function of changes in demand you know, when the supply curve is vertical. And then thirdly, right, from a policy perspective, my strong view is that what's going on in the world in, in, in most of the Western system is um, we're pivoting toward, uh, you know, from a policy perspective, a war on inequality, right? Uh, the policymaker has been working for capital for too long, um, and this pendulum is going to swing back to working for labor. Uh, and when you get things like you know, redistribution, more progressive taxation, uh, trade policy, uh, a beefing up of the welfare state, all these things you know, will ultimately create an inflection in inflation expectations long term. Uh, and inelastically supplied bearer assets that are incredibly liquid are just a very, very attractive, um, a very attractive uh, allocation option in, in, that, in, in, that, in that world, particularly uh, in the context of, uh, of um, you know, you know, place to put your capital. And, and the market penetration is low, the, the, the adoption is low, and so like the convexity in the asset as an allocator uh, is, is very, very high because the market structure is not yet mature or allocated to. John, how would you say that? So, I mean, I, you know, the, the Bitcoin is, um, is indeed, you know, it's, it's aspiring to become digital gold, right? And, and that makes a lot of sense that that, that, that happens or, or something like that happens because it's kind of silly in a digital society that our non-sovereign monetary store of value is a yellow metal. Uh, you know, we, we at some point need a better technology for that, and Bitcoin is the first viable solution, as, as, as Danny pointed out, because, the, you know, Nakamoto solved the double spin problem and a few other things that, that are really important. So um, sooner or later, that's going to happen. Now, if it were already digital gold, if it were already that thing in society, it would be worth one or two orders of magnitude more, and the opportunity um, wouldn't be the same, right? So we think of it in our portfolio as it goes in our venture portfolio. You know, we can debate about whether it's a Series B2 or a Series C um, venture bet, but that, you know, it's a it's a venture that aspires to become digital gold um, has you know, is showing great promise of doing that. Um, and because it hasn't done that yet, and because there are risks, and because, you know, lots of things could still prevent that from happening, um, there's a lot of upside. Um, also downside, that's why we treat it as a venture bet, meaning we don't put all of our assets into a single line venture bet. We, we have a, a portfolio of these things as one, uh, you know, should think about Bitcoin going into a broad portfolio of assets, not different crypto assets. I'll talk about that. I think Diversifying crypto is silly, but um, the um, in, in terms of our portfolio assets, so that's how that's how we think of it. So I think is it a macro hedge today? 
No, it's a venture bet. Um, frankly, um, you know, I'm personally reasonably bullish on the macro, or at least I think that I think that probably the scenario that the consensus assigns the wrong probability to to the greatest degree is is that actually we don't have a major macro crisis for for a little while, um, which is great because I think that'll give Bitcoin time to mature as a as a venture bet into into being digital gold in the future. Right. Okay. So, B Bitcoin is a risk asset. But it's a risk asset with a specific set of investment characteristics that become increasingly more attractive the more irresponsible monetary and fiscal policy is from central banks and governments globally. And it, it shouldn't come to as a big surprise that investors and people all around the world are having a hard time kind of getting their head around that because we haven't really had anything like that before. And we've been using gold to store value for 5,000 years. And before we were using gold, we were using other things. We were using like seashells and salt and these really big heavy rocks. And there's a framework that you put around evaluating potential stores of value. Like there's a reason that gold's gold and it's, a, it's an Austrian economics framework. It's hard versus soft money, sound versus unsound, the six characteristics of money, durable, divisible, portable, uniform, accepted, and scarce. And when you line Bitcoin up next to gold within that framework, it actually lines up pretty well. Um, and so you know, investors in, in Bitcoin today aren't investing in, in Bitcoin, I, I don't think, as a, as a store of value today. You, we're speculating that it may become a store of value because it has the characteristics to be a good store of value. Um, but if the VIX goes to 35 tomorrow, like, let me be clear, number go down. So don't get that sort of confused. Um, now, the, the morphing from a, uh, you know, and, and Bitcoin started its life as a, a, a tremendously risk on asset, like the most far out science experiment, you know, imagine paying three cents for the first Bitcoin, like what's your expected return then, right? And then it, it's morphed over the last, you know, going on 11 years now um, into, and it's gone through all these different sort of, uh, uh, identities, right, like a, like a teenager in junior high. And, you know, at first it was the science experiment that a couple hundred, you know, cypherpunks cared about. And then it was magic internet money for drug dealers to buy drugs on the internet. And then it was about blockchain, not Bitcoin. And then it was about, um, you know, Americans buying cups of coffee. And then, you know, now it's this sort of digital gold thing. Um, and, 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 and that, that morphing, and, and the sort of risk that's associated with it, it's, it's less risky today than it was several years ago. Um, but that, that morphing is not something we've, we, we've seen maybe ever in, in investing before. I, I've, I've thought about this before. John, I don't know if you have any opinions. One thing that popped in my head was Google stock, where it, when it first came out, it was like this highly risky techie, didn't really understand what the internet was, crazy sort of thing. And then it got so big, so dominant, with such a big cash position, that now it's like something, I'm sure there's billions of people around the world that would love to store their value in Google stock if they had the opportunity to, right? So, so you see it also as a venture investment at this stage? Or in that, in that yeah, framework. but not one, but the, the, the investment characteristics are, are different than you know, almost anything else that, that, that you're going to see because of, of um, I mean, I, w I would agree with John's framework. It's a venture bet on a store of value, which you just, you know, that's not like other venture bets. Maybe a way to put that a bit more precisely is you're betting that the base layer store of value for a speculative view on how the structure of the financial system could evolve, you know, so it's like the speculative bit is, what is the market structure going to look like? Is it going to be centralized and too big to fail? Or is it going to be atomized and, and, basically, and basically have authority distributed into, into sort of more credible governance across the internet, right? In that world, Bitcoin is the hardest asset, you know, of the sort of self-sovereign attestation slash notary public utility, which is what Bitcoin does, i.e. timestamp, you, know, you know, transactions and, and, and um, record, you know, in a, in a credible way. Right? Bitcoin is the hardest hard asset in a world that relies on that kind of utility to organize human activity. Um, whether or not that kind of utility comes to um, fruition, 
I think is an open is an open debate. But but a self sovereign, you know, tr trustless, totally reliable, ultra secure, you know, time stamping utility is a pretty useful piece of software for people to build all kinds of kind of atomized architectures for for organizing activity. If you believe that that's a useful piece of architecture in the system, then Bitcoin is basically the fuel for that, right? Well, you do, you, uh, and it is a very hard money in that, in that future world, but it is a speculative bet if you think that that kind of infrastructure will, will predominate later. You do need the irresponsibility from, from central banks and governments. Like if there was no quantitative easing, Bitcoin would still be a science experiment in the closets of a bunch of computer science nerds. And God bless the nerds, because we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. Yeah. But um, you, you, Bitcoin was birthed in the shadow of of the financial crisis and, and what came after that quantitative easing, it, it, it exists because of that, but also exists out, outside of that as a hedge on that. It's, it's CDS against that irresponsibility. Um, and and uh, you know, if, if, if we were still on the gold standard and if, uh, if the US government was uh, you know, balancing their budget every year instead of spending a trillion dollars more this year than they take in, a trillion dollars more next year than they take in, then uh, you know, we might not need Bitcoin so much, but that, that ain't the world that we're living in here, so. CDS, I've not heard that one. That's a good one. Add that to the, add that to the list. Let's talk a bit more about um, this idea of um, Bitcoin versus gold. Uh, you, John mentioned that. Well, we've all discussed that a little bit. I actually have an audience poll question. I'd like to kind of ask you guys something, and then that will perhaps inform our discussion. And that's, the question is this. What, what would you say to those that argue Bitcoin is a better hedge against macro troubles than gold? And there are various uh, options that you can see on the screen here. I agree, drop gold is the, the hashtag of uh, Grayscale. Drop gold. <laughs> People. Okay, so there seems to be a consensus around it's too small and too immature at this stage. Does that, that tally with, I mean, you, that kind of tallies with what you were saying, that this is a venture <coughs> better, we're, we're early. Sorry? You own gold. So we, okay, so I'm not a big, I'm not a gold bug. Um, I like, you know, I, in general, from an asset allocation perspective, I love equity because I think it sort of, it's the convex asset in the society that captures the upside of human ingenuity. So that's kind of like where I like to be in general. But right now, is what we do, we do, own, we do own some gold. And the reason we own it is basically we said, well, all of our, all the currencies that we would have, in our, we have to have some cash for liquidity purposes that are basically zero or negative yielding currencies we might as well have in gold. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, all, we re reallocate our cash. So we keep positive yielding currency and we, and we basically took all the rest into, in, in, into, into gold. But the point of all that is to say, I'm, you know, I, it's a macro tool. You know, let's also put it in perspective. In the giant global economy, all investment in gold is worth like three and a half trillion dollars. People talk about eight, but that includes like jewelry and the gold in our phones and our teeth and all that, which I don't. I, don't, I think we ought to we ought to reasonably exclude. It's it's a really valuable asset and clearly demonstrates a tremendous upside if if, if you if you have a, a new a new technology to play that role, right? Um, but you know it's 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 you know it, it is a part of a portfolio. Um, I, I personally think this poll, poll result is very consistent, right? That you know, with, with with what I'm saying, and that's and that's why it's exciting. So you know, it, it would be awfully boring to sit around and talk about you know have a we, you know have a conference like this and be talking about gold. I'm sure it happens. Can, can, can but, I build on? but but you know, the upside is is that it's not there yet, and that's what you're betting on. I, I just um, so I, I actually kind of am a gold bug. Um, in fact, I, uh, I ran the metal business at Goldman Sachs globally uh, once upon a time. Uh, gold is like this amazing um, kind of Rorschach test for professional investors, right? Everybody sees in it they, what they want to see in it. For some people, it's a pet rock. You know, you dig it out of one hole only to bury it in another hole. And, you know, that's kind of like the Warren Buffett school. For other people, it's a, it's a CDS on, on, you know, sovereign debt and, you know, the existing architecture of the banking system. And I, I thought a lot about it. And to me... It's a, it's a bond, it's a fixed income. If you think of it in a fixed income valuation framework to kind of put it in the context of how to allocate in a portfolio, specifically it's a zero real yield perpetuity to put it in kind of derivative speak. In other words, in other words it's putting your capital in cold storage, laying it down for the long haul. When you rotate into, rotate into cash, right, 
you're still short the option that some, you're long the option to be liquid and buy stuff immediately, but you're short the option that, you know, something's gonna happen to the money supply or, or the architecture of the system. Whereas, you know, gold is, is like basically committing to kind of like the term value of, the, of that optionality of I know I'm gonna put it down into cold storage, right? But gold at the end of the day, and gold is awesome because it, you know, everybody agrees through the power of the consensus that gold is valuable, that, that it will be super liquid, right? Bitcoin is kind of like that, but more so. Because to secure your property rights in gold, at the end of the day, you still have to be physically secure, right? And interact, um, you know, with, uh, with uh, you know, even if you're gonna be outside the banking system to record your title and outside, you know, things. And, and there are a bunch of interesting gold back projects, including one that we point, uh, at blockchain that we partner with uh, uh, CoinShares on called DGLD that we're uh, hard at work on. But Bitcoin itself, doesn't rely on any interface at all into the real world. There is no need for recourse to any security layer other than the privacy of your private key. And in that sense, the world's hardest hard asset is entirely virtual, mm -hmm. which is like a totally like mind-bending idea and super, super cool. Um, and again, it gets back to this idea that if you're like a store of value and you don't have a counterparty, Right? That's the key idea, that basically you're an endpoint without any reliance on anybody else. Gold serves that purpose the most of the real world hard assets, but Bitcoin serves that purpose even more because you have no counterparty other than the internet itself in all its sort of distributed glory. Yeah, it's better tech yeah. for, the same, for yeah. this use case. Yeah. Okay. Better tech, but still too early to be a replacement. Yeah, I think the, thi the, di like the big difference with gold and, and, and Bitcoin, right, is when, when, when I speak to traditional investors, right, and you're like, hey, buy Bitcoin, they're like, yeah, but where's my money? You know, if I go to HSBC and, and, and you know, take my deposit slip or, and try to redeem or whatever, the, you know, they'll hand me my pound notes, right? Putting gold on the Bitcoin blockchain is super cool because the where's my money question is answered. It's in a vault, and if you show up with your private key, you'll get your metal. Right? Bitcoin itself is, you know, it's hard to wrap, for a lot of people, it's just hard to wrap your mind around that, that, that scarcity that's entirely virtual. Um, but it doesn't make it any less real. But that's not a question of is it better or not. That's just a question of are people and systems adjusted to uh, understand and appreciate it. I think it says something about the adoption curve. Right. You know, this is some pretty extreme stuff we're talking about. I just think it's easier from an adoption perspective for the world to wrap its mind around physical gold somewhere than it is, you know, virtual property rights nowhere and everywhere at the same time. I mean, right. just to quickly recite, why, why, why is it better? So, I mean, it is ultimately fixed supply, right? And it's growing at a decreasing rate, right? Whereas gold is not an ultimately fixed supply and is growing at an increasing rate, the supply. It's hard to verify. You know, if you have a piece of, you know, if you have a piece of metal and you want to choose, find out if it's gold, actually pretty hard. Bitcoin, you can be sure whether or not it's Bitcoin. You don't know what percentage of all the world's gold you own. There's no way to know that, whereas with Bitcoin, you do. You can actually see that. On, you know, if you run a node, you can, you, you can see that. It's divisible, it's transferable, right? And, you know, it, it much, much, much more easily. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it has all these, you know, qualities that are at least as good or better, right? And it's the first thing to, to, to do that. I mean, there are lots of experiments in digital money before Bitcoin. And, and again, going back to Danny's point, what was key was this solving this double spin problem without a central, you know, intermediary. And suddenly, it's 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 it's, it's possible, and in fact, um, works quite well. That's that's exciting. And you know, just a point on the you know, is it gold or is it not gold? I find this to be a little bit of a kind of the wrong question. It's like I was like saying, was the internet better tech um, in 1996 than say traditional TV? Well, clearly, you know, for for that kind of thing. But you know, we, we didn't you know at the time we weren't you know, but you know that we weren't say watching all of our TV on the internet. Today, we're streaming on internet, right? So, you know, it's not about whether it is today that thing, it's about whether it's better tech to ultimately become that thing. Right. And that's what's exciting. Okay. I should say, by the way, that you can ask, um, I do have plenty of questions of my own, but if there are some questions that you'd like to pose to the panelists, you can do that through the app. Um, so, please do. I wonder if we could zoom out a little bit. We've obviously been got, got in, into the weeds a little bit there on kind of the Bitcoin and gold thing. But if we to kind of zoom out and talk about, I guess, why the, the purpose of why we're even having this discussion about Bitcoin and gold is kind of the macro picture. And John, you've already said that you're perhaps not that um, concerned at this point. But I, I wonder, there are some things that perhaps are, 
ag ugly, you could say, or there are certain, I mentioned QE, I mentioned uh, US recession threats and whatnot. But I wonder what would, um, what is necessary to sort of change the argument about Bitcoin? I mean, what, what, what are there sort of external shocks or things that can happen? We're talking about uh, fiscal and macro irresponsibility and, and whatnot. Are there certain things that could um, happen to really increase and boost the appeal of Bitcoin? I'm going to put that question to you, panel, panel, in a minute. But I actually wanted to ask you, audience, that same question first. Um, so there's another poll question, and as you can see, we're really we're really dining out on these poll questions. This <laughs> technology is quite fun. It's so fun. let it's me ask you: uh, Which of these events is the most likely to encourage greater adoption of Bitcoin in 2020? I thought trade wars would have featured higher than that. <coughs> Sovereign debt. I'm, I'm surprised inflation is so low in the consensus. That tells you how the market's positioned. Right. It feels so impossible right now. Yeah. Well, things can change pretty fast. Well, I wonder in light of kind of what the audience are saying. I mean, I, do you. What's the what difference the between trigger? inflation pickup and fiat currency devaluation? Yeah, I feel like that's the same bucket. All right, we've got to add those together. 32%. It's winning, actually. I'm with you, Travis. Let's not criticize the poll. Let's move on with the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's criticize the, the guy who wrote it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in your face, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> you got me there. But I wonder, how would, how would you respond to that? Are there certain things that could uh, accelerate the argument around, around Bitcoin adoption in kind of the macro context? Are there, are there things that can move it forward? I, I mean, I, I think quantitative easing is the most bullish backdrop for, for, for Bitcoin. Um, it, we haven't seen a full-blown recession since Bitcoin was created. I, I, I guess it depends on the type of recession, if it's an inflationary versus a deflationary. An inflationary recession feels something approaching impossible in the near term right now. Uh, you know, you never say never, but um, I, 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 it doesn't strike me because, I mean, I think the world goes risk off in a, in an, in a recession. Um, it doesn't strike me that, that Bitcoin's price would go up in, in, with that as the backdrop. Um, I also don't think that that's a huge risk for, for 2020. I mean, Trump got his three cuts in his QE that's not actually QE, so don't call it QE. Um, and it, the whole world is, is cutting rates and, and, and um, you know, juicing increasingly more sort of exotic forms of quantitative easing right now. So that's all a, a, a great backdrop and I think probably the, the most important part of that. The other thing that I, I, is not on this list that uh, is important is um, the social side of it. And um, there's this term that's been going around in at least my circles lately, uh, dissident tech, um, in terms of technology that helps enable dissidents. And uh, having uh, more and more pockets of the world waking up to uh, what I would summarize is power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely and pushing back against that, which you are seeing at an increasing rate right now globally. Um, I think having that part working is an important part of the, of the overall backdrop as well too. Um, I think it's super interesting because kind of the big known unknowns risk-wise and macro world that people kind of you know, sweat about over the last couple of years, none of them have actually happened, right? Hasn't actually been a hard Brexit. There hasn't been a Euro governance crisis. The trade war with China has, you know, it goes up and down, but it hasn't really metastasized into anything like, like you know, resembling a supply side inflation shock in, in the supply chain that people actually worry about. And then most importantly, you know, there hasn't actually been any movement on wealth redistribution and attacking the pervasive inequality. But when we talk about monetary policy and QE4, the prospect of QE4, like make no mistake about it, it's a totally known, you know, common knowledge. It's not even an open secret. It's a common knowledge that QE is a regressive tax on the middle class and hands value to incumbent asset holders. Everybody knows it. It's not like that's a controversial point to make. What is potentially more <gasps> controversial is to say to the policymakers, hey, you know what? If you take this same hammer to hammer a different nail in the same way with more QE and make it even more unequal, 
there is going to be a whirlwind to reap. Now, like, that is manifesting now. Jeremy Corbyn wants to ban private education, okay? They, you know, like, like the, the amount of, you know, Elizabeth Warren's got a wealth tax. This stuff is in the pipeline, and it's, it's going to happen one way or another. So when you think about the pushes, I totally agree with Travis that, like, to get the big explosive move in Bitcoin price-wise for the next leg, you need a change in the market structure in terms of new fiat inflows into the asset class, right? You can't, you can't double from 200 billion to 400 billion without you know, more kind of institutional sources of capital starting to rotate. I, I do kind of agree with that idea. Um, but those push factors haven't happened yet. And everybody kind of thinks that they may or may not happen. And the market currently, you know, this last couple of weeks is repricing this sort of idea that recession is going to get pushed out from Q419 to 20, late 2020, maybe 2021, if at all. You know, that's all fine. But the political <clears throat> rules of the game are in the process of being radically retraded. And you know, what Bitcoin is is basically, is basically a bet on an architecture that's resilient to that. So as an asset allocator, I think it's a phenomenally interesting hedge because it's demonstrably useful in that, in that state of the world. And the actual adoption in terms of portfolio allocation is basically nothing in the grand scheme of things. So you have this thing that, yes, maybe it looks like a speculative bet in terms of its potential you know, penetration of a, of a future total addressable market, but at the same time actually has the, the sort of like risk off properties for this future world. I think it's incredibly interesting and, and, and um, all those things, any or all of those things could happen, but the biggest underlying thematic aspect of all of it is policy is gonna work for labor, not for capital on the forward, and the market is not set up for that, full stop. If, if we take the conversations that are looking forward, um, one of the biggest stories uh, this year in the kind of the crypto market has obviously been Libra. There's also been the People's Bank of China um, pushing its central bank digital currency, which is something that we'll see soon. And so this is kind of a new paradigm of uh, kind of digitized fiat and then whatever we're going to call Libra, I guess something similar. How does Bitcoin play in, in that environment? I mean, obviously, we're sort of speculating forward a bit, um, but the People's Bank of China initiative could come soon. Libra may or may not come, let, let's see. But, um, but how, how, how does Bitcoin play in, in that environment? Look, I, th I think of it, my, my own view, and there are different views, is that um, I think digital fiat will be a big, a big deal. Um, and I think it will probably dominate the, the payments use case, because why not? You know, you don't really need, you know, you, don't, no, you can't go out and, you know, go out today, guys, and find a shop in London that will take your gold. Um, has little to do with its value. Um, and, um, um, and I think that you know, it'll, they'll, they'll sit alongside one another. I think they're very complementary. Um, I think it'll facilitate the development of, of Bitcoin as, you know, the, as, 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 as digital gold, um, to, to use the cliche term, um, both in terms of on and off ramps, but also in terms of just people getting familiar with using these kinds of technologies and it becoming embedded in, 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 their, in their thought process. And I, I want to come back to the last question just briefly on this point, which is to say, I kind of I think none of those go, things I was are. Make you go back to that one. If you yeah, yeah, I was okay. I well, to hear your answer. I mean, my, I, I kind of I think none of that is the answer. Is because I, I think the most like any like any early stage tech bet, the most important things are idiosyncratic to the to the the venture, right? You know, it's it's specific to the thing, and that that, are, that really outweigh it. It's like saying, look. Did Amazon stock, you know, Amazon, I'm taking Amazon because they went public before the, the, the dot-com bubble crash. You can't say this about Google or, or Facebook or whatever because the, the data aren't there. You know, it, the, the price went up and then it crashed and then it went back up. Would you have said that that was basically macro-driven? Or was it driven by what Amazon executed on, right? And, and I think that ultimately what really mattered for that, you know, for that stock is what Amazon executed on. Did it have some, you know, did it create some noise and some short-term effects? Yeah, but, but you, you know, if you had looked at Amazon as a macro bet in, you know, in, in 2001, you would have completely missed the point, right? And, and so, you know, what I think is the most, you know, what do I think is the biggest catalyst for Bitcoin being worth more in the future? That it just is there. It just is there and it stays there and it's there every day and it keeps running and it has, it has been, you know, for, 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 you know, for, for quite a long time now. And one of the things I, you know, I hear from friends of mine who don't, you know, who aren't investors, who aren't, you know, who don't spend time in this space, is you kind of get this, there's like, yeah, it's still there. And I'm like, yeah, it's still there. You know, and, I, and, I, and, 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 and that, I think, what, what, you know, what the effect of that is, is that 
as time passes, um, you know, it, you get continued adoption, people continuing to get used to it, understanding it better, even at, you know, at an intuitive level. Not, you don't need to understand that much of the tech, in fact. We're just kind of understanding at an intuitive level this notion of, actually, no, this really is, you know, uh, you know all the things that Charles was saying it is, right, and, 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 and the Traps was saying it is. I think that's going to be the most important thing. And you just have to kind of wait for that to happen. And that will generate new demand, and it's happening. Um, it just that what happens is, is that that builds in a steadier, more, more sort of consistent way than the price moves. Sure. Um, right. I would focus on that longer term build. Okay. Travis, did you want to follow that? You... Um, on, the, on the China Libra thing, uh, that one's dynamic and complicated and um, multifaceted. Um, you know, f f taking a step back, I think it's apparent that the role and concept and definition of money are evolving in real time and that money and technology are at an intersection right now that is um, of pretty historic levels. Um, and the single largest global macro factor in existence today, which is, which is U.S.-China relations, <clears throat> it, it appears that blockchain has sort of inserted itself right into the middle of that, which is weird because like sometimes over the last like couple months it's felt like this is a bear market, which is like really weird because it's up 140% year to date and it's like right in the middle of the global macro sort of, sort of landscape right now, which is like this odd feeling. But um, it's, I think there's a, there, there's a few factors. One, the, the DCEP and, and how it relates to WeChat and Alipay, that part's not clear to me, whether or not they work in tandem with one another or whether or not DCEP is going to eat WeChat and Alipay because the, the, the Chinese government is not getting the level of, of surveillance that they want f from WeChat and Alipay. Um, so that part I'm not clear about. Uh, and then whether or not, uh, I think at the beginning of the whole Libra thing, and if you were paying attention to all of the, the uh, hearings, it's apparent that a lot of the U.S. politicians are, are you know, were kind of quite ignorant about uh, um, a host of things, but uh, this one in particular. Um, and uh, I think that the U.S. didn't realize how much they need Libra to go compete against WeChat, Alipay, and now the DCEP for national security reasons. Um, especially on the continent of Africa. And you ask any kind of global macro economist like where the GDP per capita growth is going to come from over the next 50 years, it's like very straightforward that it's coming from that continent. And while, while, while the U.S. spent $10 trillion, you know, in, in sand dunes fighting a war that we never should have fought, well, China spent $10 trillion or whatever the number was on the continent of Africa getting their infrastructure anchors like really kind of, kind of put in there. And, and then you go proliferate WeChat and Alipay through that continent, and, and, and that puts the United States in a pretty tough spot, in my, in my opinion. Uh, it's, it's, you know, so it's hard, to, it's hard to tell exactly what's going on with Libra and, and uh, U.S. politicians. We know that one of the very, very few sort of things that both sides of the aisle can agree upon is that it's very popular to shit on Facebook. And so politicians are doing what politicians do, which is stand up and hand wave um, ab about that, and, and they've taken their shots. And, but behind closed doors, you know, if, if I were Libra, I would be educating them about what the state of all of this is. And, and it's still my guess, and I could be totally wrong on this, but I would guess that with some changes around the margin, you know, maybe the, the foundation's not in Switzerland, it's in the United States. Maybe it's not a basket of currencies, but it's sort of, sort of uh, either all U.S. dollar or, you know, individual, you know, fund, money market type of funds that are just individual currencies, but that the U.S. government's going to realize that if they don't get Libra out there to start competing against China in, in this situation, that they're multiple sort of years away, and, and they may not be comfortable with uh, giving, giving them that magnitude of a head start. But, I, but I'm not highly convicted on that. So, Right. We've got time for one final question. Um, so, sorry, it's not going to be from here. It's one that I wanted to ask. As a journalist who covers this space, I hear a lot... Um, various kind of market rumors about this macro hedge fund and that macro hedge fund, Tudor and Millennium and more capital, and all these people are investing in Bitcoin. And I've not seen any evidence of this, and maybe you could tell me if there is any evidence. But let me ask you perhaps a, 
an easier question for you to answer here on the record on the stage is um, is now a sensible time for macro hedge funds and kind of macro investors to be investing in Bitcoin or just exploring Bitcoin? And just one, one thing I would say on the answer to your question is yeah. I, I, what I believe. So are the, are the funds themselves invested in Bitcoin? Mm, not so sure. I know for a fact that all the PMs are personally invested in yeah. Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. And, but when's and, that transition? <laughs> well, I, I, that's, a tough, that's a tough step, right? The key step is, and, and it's a big bear, it's a big chasm to go from investing your own money to investing money that's been, you know, that, that, that you're entrusted to invest. Right. And I think that chasm will be crossed at some point, um, but it's a chasm. Um, right now, we're still in the phase of people investing their own money, but it's very, very I, you know, I, I, I think a lot of very smart people um, that are doing that. To, to me, to me, it's like, it's like 2010 in the subprime market, right? People would look at, you know, bombed out asset-backed securities at 10 cents on the dollar or 30 cents on the dollar, and, you know, most people are like, oh, yeah, but I can't buy it. Oh, it's too hard. You know, but the people who liked money, you know, they were like, I'm going to find <laughs> out, figure out a way and then buy a lot. And then, like, the problem you kind of had to solve was, like, you know, who, who, who's aggressive enough to, to go and, like, grab the money when the value is sitting there and is willing to sort of take that little bit of, of sort of, you know, career risk to go in and take money? You know, for me, like, the highest compliment anybody ever paid me on Wall Street was, like, that guy likes money. I like money. <laughs> and so, like, yeah, I think it's a great time to be buying this stuff. You should buy it. You should totally buy it because it's fit for purpose for how the world is evolving. And I, I know we're out of time, but I wanted to just make one more comment on, on, on Libra. Because, because I think it's really important, right? Digital assets are a true blue technological solution for too big to fail because the self-custody that they empower allows real-time transactional asset segregation, okay? I think there's a big question about whether, you know, the future model of how that is going to be delivered to the consumer, right, is in the sort of super app kind of WeChat model and that's a, it's a single contiguous relationship or whether it's more kind of atomized and organic. You know, maybe the relationship with the customer is the OEM and the phone. Maybe it's an app on the phone. Maybe it's the protocol and brand buy into the protocol. Totally unknown and super, super interesting. But digital asset technology is a radical disintermediation t uh, machine for the delivery of financial services by virtue of the automation embedded in smart contracts and by virtue of self-custody, which is the secret to delivering financial services on a much more capital light basis because the expensive bit where you take everybody's money, put it in a pot and write regulated liabilities against it, that bit you don't have to do anymore. So when you think about Libra, I view Libra as one potential pathway for what it's gonna take to build a you know, solution to too big to fail that implies real time self custody and therefore building a banking like banking system with a far lighter capital need. Somebody somewhere is going to do that because the prospect of a platform that's got the earnings power, so the revenue generation power of a global bank on the capital base of a global, you know, of, of a tech platform is just too interesting to pass up and it's too technologically fit for purpose not to happen. So it will happen. The question is, you know, from an innovator's dilemma perspective, you know, will the regulators allow it or is it going to happen organically kind of like, you know, one smaller jurisdiction at a time? And I think that bit is totally open for debate. Um, but it's super promising, and, and whether or not it's Libra or something else, my, my bet, my view is, in the end, it will be a fully distributed consensus like, like Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin Core or Ethereum, something like that, that scales and empowers that self-custody and automation to deliver capital light banking services you know, five times more efficiently from a capital perspective and a thousand times safer from a too-big-to-fail perspective. Mm. I'm going to have to cut it there. I knew that conversation, uh, what well, it did go on, I knew it could have gone on a lot longer. Our panelists will be around a little bit at the end, so please do grab them uh, after that. But thank you very much to Travis, John, and Thank you, Alex. Great. Thank you. Thank you.